Honestly, there's like so many examples out there of health promotion campaigns um, who I didn't, I chose not to actually look at, but like you are probably familiar with, and we'll talk about them later uh, in another module is participation. Participation has done so many different campaigns over the years. For instance, they had one in uh, during the Olympics that focused on different types of activities that you can do, and that there's so many f different fun ways of doing physical activity. They have more of a recent one that's all about how physical activity makes everything better, including like sex and things like that. They had a, like an older one that focused more on like, don't just think about doing physical activity, get out and do it. Okay, so these are all different health promotion campaigns, goal oriented, time limited, there's a central audience, central message, and there's often a coordinated set of tactics that support a particular strategy. But I decided to talk about three health promotion campaigns, um, one of which you are probably well familiar with, which is uh, Bell's Let's Talk campaign, okay, by the telecommunication company uh, Bell Canada. So it's an awareness campaign that originally started in 2010. And remember I said it's time sensitive, it's like a you know, for a limited time. This was only supposed to go on for five years, but they picked it up again in 2015, and they just recently picked it up again in 2020 for other five years. Um, this, <laughs> we'll talk about like the corporation aspect of this in a little bit. Um, this was originally part of Bell Canada's corporate social responsibility program. And to their credit, um, a lot of companies have these programs, you know, for various reasons, we won't get into that, but um, no one had really picked mental health before. So a lot of companies, like they focus on like breast cancer or like cardiovascular disease or whatever else, but to Bell's credit, they decided to focus their, their campaign on something that people perhaps uh, don't talk about as much. Okay, so you've probably, you might know who this is, that's Clara Hughes, one of our most um, uh, meddled <laughs> uh, Olympians here in Canada, both in the Winter and the Summer Olympics, which is pretty impressive. So she was a really big part of the original uh, Bell Let's Talk campaign, because she's really vocal about her own struggles with uh, mental health, specifically depression. So they had two main target groups, Canadians with mental illness, and their secondary target was also employers as well. And their messages were often the ones that really came out, especially to employers and Canadians with mental illness, is like anti-stigma messages. Okay, so um, it's not your fault, don't be afraid of being judged, there's help available, just be open, but let's talk about it. Okay, that was the, the main um, message. Okay, so like I just said, one of their main strategies was to reduce stigma. And speaking of strategies, and I keep mentioning the Canadian Obesity Network because they're near and dear to my heart, uh, but this is actually one of the main strategies that the Canadian Obesity Network focuses their efforts on to is reducing stigma. Not just tackling obesity, but reducing stigma as a way to get more interest in actually funding this and talking about it and making a difference in this area. Okay. Another one of their focuses or main strategies on community care and access, funding research, and a focus on workplace mental health too. Okay? As far as their tactics go, you can read this, but they have a lot of different tactics. Primarily, you probably know that it's a social media campaign, so on Bell's Let's Talk Day, which is typically in January, uh, every time that you uh, post something about mental health and you use the Bell hashtag, they donate five cents to kind of a, a pot that they then use to like fund different initiatives. And you can go on their website to see some of the different initiatives that that money has gone to. Okay, uh, but, but education campaign as well, television ads, using a particular spokesperson, um, and then as far as the, the workplace side of things, they also had workshops for senior managers, providing statistics to the workplace as well. And then through their different partnerships, that also helped them raise awareness and also to fund certain initiatives as well. And as far as their research side of things, that really focused on funding things, funding different projects, okay, that focused on different aspects of mental health, okay? So one of the things that we talked about in the last unit about campaigns is you also have to evaluate them. You can't just run something and then like not show what you did. 
Okay, so if you go on Bell's website, this is some of the things that they will highlight. Okay, so they've had more than a billion interactions. So an interaction is like um, someone see, watching a video on mental health that they posted or someone posting a hashtag about um, for Bell, Bell's Let's Talk Day. So a lot of interactions, which means visibility. Okay. Um, they've also donated more than 100 million to mental health initiatives, funded a lot of community grants, and you can read the rest of the results as well. Okay, and they have some more specific results here as well. Okay, something that they really like to highlight too is that 83% of Canadians reported believing attitudes about mental health have changed for the better since the program. Okay. Uh, depends how they actually got that information, but um, this just shows the importance of outcome evaluation. And for Bell, like, is this actually making a difference? Like, are people paying attention? Are they listening to it? Or should we do another corporate responsibility program? You know, it also helps them make decisions about should we keep funding this or should we go in a different direction? That's why we do outcome evaluation and process evaluation too. However, it's worth mentioning if we are talking about this particular campaign that it's not without its controversy. Okay, so there's a lot of outlets and very vocal people in this arena that are saying it's not a health promotion campaign, it's a marketing campaign. And Bell has gotten a lot of free marketing out of this particular uh, strategy. Okay, and I don't disagree. <laughs> But like they could have also done nothing at the same time and people are talking more about mental health. So I, I definitely have an issue with this concept of corporatization of mental health. Um, so it's a, an interesting thing for companies to consider when they are deciding on these programs or whether to partake in them. Like, you know, I'd rather they partake in them than just keep all the money to themselves that they make, especially a company like Bell or any telecommunication company. But like your efforts are always going to be a little bit stained because, you know, at the end of the day, we know you just kind of want to make money too, okay? Um, the other issue that actually came out of this as well, another big controversy that came out of their campaign is like, uh, Bell isn't actually known for being really great to its employees. And a lot of employees actually came out during this campaign kind of against Bell and saying like, well, you talk about mental health and workplace mental health, but this is the way you've been treating us. Okay, so just an interesting side note about this particular campaign, because I don't want to always paint things as like rainbows and sunshines. <laughs> There's other things to consider too. So our next campaign that I want to look at is a really interesting one that's actually been going on for a long time and keeps getting picked up by different places, including many European cities. And now in Canada, we are, we are maybe going to try this out in certain communities too. And this is something called the Icelandic model. Okay, so in your readings, you're going to learn a little bit more about this. But basically what was happening in the kind of 80s and 90s is that they had a huge uh, teenage drinking and drug use, but specifically drinking problem um, throughout Iceland, especially in the capital. Okay, so what they thought is like, we got to do something about this. But they didn't want to really base it on a behavior change model. Okay, so they didn't really think that that was going to be the best way to focus their efforts and instead their strategies really focused on the environment and social context. Okay, so when I say social deviance models, social deviance models, these basically say for the most part that like, you know, there's always going to be people that are going to go outside of society's norms. Okay, but if we make kind of the norm more acceptable, or cooler, we're gonna have less deviance, okay? We're gonna make that deviation less possible, okay? So what they argued is that one of the reasons that um, Iceland had such a drinking problem um, was that there wasn't any really like environmental things against that. There wasn't any restrictions or there wasn't anything that really slowed it down. Okay. There wasn't a lot of community investment or individual investment in slowing it down and kids had nothing else to do. And I've never been to Iceland. I hear it's beautiful, but I also hear it's dark as hell in the winter, you know, and the weather cannot be that great and cold as well. You know, so what are you going to do when you get out of school if you don't have anything else fun to do as well? Okay. So that was a lot of their focus on this. So their goal was to reduce substance abuse in adolescence. And like I said, they really targeted the social context. OK, 
okay? And they targeted peers, family, leisure time, and school. Okay, so a lot of this is where their efforts were focused on. Okay, so this is from one of the health promoters who was really kind of integral to the whole program, and, and I thought this was really interesting. Why not orchestrate a social movement around natural highs, around people getting high on their own brain chemistry? Because it seems obvious to me that people want to change their consciousness without the, without the deleterious effects of drugs. Okay, so can they do that without drugs? So when I say natural highs, a lot of the Icelandic model's efforts were on creating opportunities for um, kids, for adolescents, to have like fun things to do after school. Okay, so you can look at some of their guiding principles. You could argue that these are strategies. They're not like specific enough to be strategies, but they kind of go over some of their main targets. So their main targets were on changing the social context to make, to focus on natural highs, right? To make it less, to also make it so people have less opportunities to drink as well. And there's more sanctions against drinking too. And they also really focus their efforts on the, the like social context. And so when I say social context on like parents and schools and those kind of things. Okay, so one of their main focuses was on after school programs. Okay, really, they put a lot of money into leisure. Okay, so a lot of like gymnastics, a lot of like soccer, a lot of like different after school programs. And the idea here is that you know, kids are just like they just want to like have fun and meet people, and like you know, out drinking is one way to do that, but there's other ways of drink doing that as well. Another main area was on sanctions, on like making it so it's like you can't do something. Okay, so curfews were enacted as well. And in one of the videos that I'm posting, you can actually see like even still today, like adults will go and patrol <laughs> the neighborhood and make sure kids aren't out after a certain time, depending on the age group. Okay, they also banned alcohol and tobacco advertisement. Um, they also really focused on the parents and creating, um, kind of convincing the parents that it was important to have quality time with their kids after school. So again, they were less likely to, to deviate, okay? Um, an interesting thing about their sports program is uh, they believe that's the reason why like Icelandic soccer or football is uh, doing so much better than it was before and that they were able to beat some of their rivals in um, some more recent uh, sporting events. So that's interesting. Okay. So again, we run a program, we evaluate it. Is it actually working? And these are like this is like what any health promoter like gets super excited about. They're like, oh, that's so sexy, right? To see rates of something go down so significantly, okay? So of the number of teenagers reporting that they got drunk in the past 30 days, it went from like, like two fifths of, of teenagers to like less than 10%. Okay, again, smoking went down and so did uh, cannabis use too. Okay, so these are some more specifics about those outcomes. Okay, so a time spent with parents increased almost, well, doubled more or less. Participation in organized sports pretty much doubled as well. And the use of cigarettes dropped significantly too. Okay, another big outcome that we would add to the list of like successes is how much this is being picked up. So another example of this of like an outcome success that's similar to this is like Insight, the supervised injection site that originated here in, um, or had part of its origins here in Canada, that's being picked up by so many other different communities around the world so that they add as one of their outcome successes, okay? And like I said, we are also here in Canada looking at this model, so t article from 2020, uh, to pick up this um, particular initiative to focus on um, uh, rural Canadians and reducing substance abuse in those uh, communities, okay? So I gave kind of two campaigns that have been really effective and the Icelandic model kept getting picked up. It was originally a short-term campaign, but it kept getting like picked, this is working, this is working, this is working, we're learning lessons, let's keep going, let's keep going. 
Um, and this was a campaign that you may or may not be familiar with. When I was a kid, I did D.A.R.E. <laughs> myself, Drug Abuse Resistance Education, uh, D.A.R.E. to keep kids off drugs. And this was an initiative that was both in the States and Canada, and it really focused, their strategy was really on prevention. It wasn't on like getting people off of drugs, it was like stopping them from ever using drugs in the first place, which is why they focused on fourth and fifth graders. And as far as their tactics go, it was more or less an education campaign, and they did different ways of educating uh, fourth and fifth graders, including, and I remember this, having police officers come into the school and like, you know, put the fear of God <laughs> into these kids about drug use. And I put myself back in that classroom and I was such like a people pleaser and like a tell me what to do and I'll do exactly that thing back then. And I'm like, I will never have a drink of alcohol. I will never do anything, smoke marijuana or have a cigarette. Not that I've done any of those things, of course not. Um, but it's so funny that like, you know, a fourth or fifth year, uh, a fourth or fifth grader they might say they're never going to do something, but when it comes around to it, you know, later on, these programs really show their effectiveness when, or ineffectiveness, when students get to more of that using age, okay? So D.A.R.E. is not seen as a successful uh, health promotion campaign. So specifically, students who participated in D.A.R.E. had significantly higher rates of hallucinogenic drug use than those that did not participate. And part of the reason why is that it was just basically education. And it wasn't like changing the social context. It wasn't like, um, you know, teaching people what to do instead, for instance. And also, and I remember this, it was very fear-based and almost like lying fear-based. It was like, <laughs> the message was more or less like if you do drugs you're gonna absolutely ruin your life like if you smoke one marijuana cigarette you are going to like end up you know on the streets it was very fear-based and when it's like that unrealistic the messaging it doesn't necessarily have the desired effects especially when you're like that's not true you know marijuana is not gonna kill me for instance when you learn that that's not true it kind of lessens the the whole messaging too Okay, so they compare it to other interventions at the same time, like a lot of smaller interactive programs, and they found that those were more effective. That said, like, we needed to do programs like this. We needed to learn. The more of these campaigns we do, the more we're like, that doesn't work, this works, that doesn't work. You know, and we can start building an evidence base to make, to construct better campaigns that actually do what we would like to do. So I just wanted to give you guys those three examples so we can really look at like target groups, central messages, strategies and tactics, and also outcome measures, okay, to show how all of those are reflected within specific health promotion campaigns. But I encourage you to like go out and like look up other health promotion campaigns and see if you can like figure out all of those things um, as part of those as well.